Over the years, time teams dug in fields and caves and under car parks and in palaces, as well as in a fair few back gardens. But one thing we've never done is to dig up someone's living room. When the owner bought this 13th century manor house here at Nazington in Northamptonshire 35 years ago, it was just a derelict shell. While restoring it, she discovered it was much older than it appeared. Under here, she found evidence of what may be a Saxon hall. Now, documentary records show us that King Canute visited his estate here sometime during his reign. Could the Saxon remains under this floor be King Canute's hall? And can we find out in just three days? This is Nassington, a little village about five miles from Peterborough, and its centre, the Manor House. But a thousand years ago, neither the Manor House nor much of the village existed. This was then a Saxon royal estate, and somewhere on it stood a great hall where King Canute once stayed. Are the remains of it under the Manor House? And if so, can we find out what this, one of the earliest palaces in the country, looked like? This is one of those sites where quite a lot of work's been done already. This is a plan of Nassington Manor. This is what we think is pre-Saxon archaeology. This, we think, might be from the time of Canute. And all this is post-Canute medieval archaeology. Jane, who worked all this out? Um, we did. I was a couple of archaeologists. We took up all the floors here, right round this part of the house, and um, did a full-scale archaeological excavation. Can you orientate me? Yes, indeed. Um, this one here is a very large post hill just down here. Just here? Just yeah. round there, that's right. Yeah. yeah, and is this a post hill here? This is another post hill over here, which is uh, quite a large one, which is round there. Yeah, okay. and these long things here, what are they? That's a silby, maybe the wall trench for the outside of the building, and that goes along the edge. Of, the, of this wall here. And just under this, yes. this dead butterfly? Yes, yes. There, yeah. And uh, over here is this That's the other trench? side of the building. Here? Yep, there, right the way along, yes. Joe, does this look convincing to you as a Saxon hall? Yes, I think we've got a tantalising glimpse here of a pretty convincing late Saxon hall, which would be a large timber building with great big posts supporting a, a, a big timber roof. But Gary, at the moment, all this is a bit of a hunch, isn't it? It is, Tony. Two post holes don't make a hole. We don't know what size it is. How are we going to find that out? The only way we're going to find it out is by looking here. To see if we can find another post hole? Correct. And also through into the passage. And hopefully we'll find another post hole there. That way we'll be able to determine length, size, hopefully at width of the alignment. But before we do any of that, we're going to have to get rid of the furniture. Get the I don't really know whether I feel more like time team removals or a bailiff, really, do you? Like <laughs> <laughs> you don't suppose you expect to be doing that, did you? No, Climbing up ladders and taking tapestries down. Not the normal sort of preamble to an excavation, <laughs> is it? <laughs> <laughs> Now the furniture's out, it's time to get the floors up. Take these tiles up one by one. They have to go back exactly as they are. Look, this one here? Yeah. That one's all right. But this is a listed house and the tiles must go back as we found them. So the challenge for Bridges and Matt is to get them up intact, which is harder than it sounds. No, yeah, they actually concreted it into the ground. Uh, into That's the absolutely tiles. solid, isn't it? Yep. But not as hard as the concrete at the other end of the house. While the archaeologists are gradually dismantling Jane's house, Gary and Joe are trying to make sense of the archaeology that's already been found under the floors. They're comparing it with other Saxon halls that have been excavated nearby. 
we've got some very good local examples that should help us understand the building because we've got bits and pieces of the jigsaw here but by no means a full plan. Um, this is a site t uh, at a place called West Cotton at Rawns near Northampton so not far from here at all and you can see here that we've got a timber hall with an up two aisles on either side with the post holes here so very like the model that we're looking at with um, deep uh, wall trenches on either side. I'm confused. Should an aisled hall have one set of wooden supports or two? should have two, but the problem we've got here is we've only got one set. Mm -hmm. Now, it may be in the original excavation that the posts here were either missed, they were lost, destroyed during an earlier age... Or maybe they didn't exist at all. Exactly. So what we've got to look at is another scenario, and maybe these posts were central posts. So we may be looking for the rest of the building out here. Hang on, so that means that the whole building could be inside that room going in that direction, or that could just be half of it, and the other half is out here. Absolutely, and the only way we're going to find that out is by digging out here. Most Saxon halls bear the weight of the roof on pillars or walls at the sides, so to find one with central pillars would be very unusual. But Gary's theory's got one big advantage. His supposed outer wall is outside the house, and we won't have to lift concrete to test it. In fact, with the aid of a turf cutter, we should be down on the archaeology pretty quickly. Jane's not just uncovered some fascinating archaeology, but also a huge haul of finds, which pottery expert Paul Blinkhorn has been wading through for years. We've got about uh, 14,000 pieces of pottery. 14,000 14,000 of sherds of pottery. And Paul, what are they telling us, those sherds? Well, they're giving us virtually an unbroken pottery sequence from the Iron Age through to the present day. Um, there's a selection of stuff laid out on the table here uh, with some replicas, just to give you some idea of what we've got. It's when we get into the late Saxon period around here that things start to get really interesting. We're about, Why is that? Well, we're six miles from Stamford, which was arguably the most important late Saxon pottery industry in the country. It started up around about 850, went right through to about 1200. But the really unique thing about Stamford Ware is it's glazed. It's virtually the only late Saxon glazed pottery found anywhere in the country. And then what about this? Well, this is when we're getting into the medieval period. Again, this is made 10 miles down the road at a place called Livedon. It's standard uh, medieval courseware, everyday pottery, Dates about 1150 to 1350, 1400. Uh, this is actually a real pot, it's been reconstructed. This you actually found on this site, Jane? Yes, we did, in the front it's garden. It's huge, yes. great big sheds yes. of it. No wonder yes. you noticed there was something going on here. <laughs> we think that the beginning of that something was Canute's Manor. We know that Canute came to Nassington from the Ramsey Chronicle, written in the 12th century in a nearby abbey. And we also know that this manor was the royal estate. We've got some very good evidence from Doomsday Book, which was written in 1086, um, by, commissioned by William the Conqueror. That's what, 30 years after Canute's death? 50 stand. years, 50 years after his death. Yeah. Um, so, and that tells us um, that the manor at Nassington belonged to the king. So it would have actually been part of his uh, manorial complex. It would have been a manor belonging to him. So the Isled Hall we're looking for definitely belonged to Canute. But who was this Canute? We've all heard of him, but know next to nothing about him. Although he was the King of England, he wasn't English. He was a Viking. And he wasn't the fool who tried to turn back the waves. We've got that story wrong. He was an astute political operator, and it was a stunt to show the limitations of his power. In fact, um, it probably did happen as a planned act of piety. In what way? Because what can you says to them after the seers drenched him is... Look how insignificant my power is compared with God's. So it's an act of piety. But I thought he was a Viking. Why was he pious? He was pious because that was what English kings of the period were expected to be. And by being pious, he could appear legitimate. So it was a bit of diplomacy, really, yes. to try and get people on side? Yes, definitely, yes. Uh, what was he doing over here? Well, he was the son of Swain of Denmark, who conquered England in the reign of Ethelred the Unready and then died almost straight away. 
And at the end of 1016, Knut becomes king. Was he a good king? He was extremely effective. By the end of his reign, he is not only king of England, he's king of Denmark, he controls Norway, he probably controls part of Sweden, and his daughter is being betrothed to the future German emperor. And he is one of the great European figures of his time. Back inside the house, we can't yet say it's an aisled hall, but at least we're making some progress. We also want to know about the wider estate. Comparison with other Saxon manors gives us good reason to believe that there should be plenty of buildings on this site as well as the hall. Looking at other plans of sites that have been excavated, you can see this is Rawns Furnells, this is not far from here. And you can see you've got two ranges of buildings, a series of detached buildings all around that complex. Then you look at um, West Cotton here, again another range of buildings. You see the whole area is packed with buildings. We simply don't know what they're used for, but you'd never find a hall of this size, this importance at that date on its own. There must be other buildings around here. And to be quite honest, what I'd really like to do is actually do some excavation around here to find out where the other buildings were. It hasn't been touched yet. Well, you're going to have to persuade Gary of that. Oh, give me a chance. Mm -hmm. Geophys are already on the case, looking for traces of these other buildings in the garden. But Hardcore, laid down to create a farmyard, is giving them a problem. The usual Geophys techniques rely on reading electrical currents or magnetism in the ground, but that won't work here. Instead, they're using radar, which can see through the layer of hard core, but which takes far longer to process. Luckily, not all of our sites affected, and there's an area by the fish pond where resistivity and magnetometry should work. Outside in the garden, Phil, looking for the rest of the hall, has indeed hit something hard, a few centimetres below the surface. I reckon we'll go through it. Let's have that out. Unfortunately, this may be the natural bedrock, and it means that unless substantial features have been cut right down into it, the archaeology has been landscaped away. I reckon that's natural, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Further digging confirms our worst fears. Phil's got almost no archaeology, and certainly nothing Saxon. If it was a later feature, if it was late Saxon or medieval, there'd be loads of pot and stuff coming out of it. So, yeah. yeah. There's not any old rock, though, aren't there? Eh? Oh, the natural's nasty around here. I mean, you, old rock. you've got, you, you know, it changes over like 50 metres. You'll be on limestone, then you'll be on clay, then there'll be patches of sand and gravel, then there'll be outcrops of ironstone, you know. I mean, it's, it's Mate, classier what, country, you know. Once you get your oil in, it ain't too bad. Ah, oh, lovely. lovely. Inside the house, the tiles are finally coming up, and our diggers can do what they came here to do some archaeology. Bridget? Hello. Are you... Harry. Where are you? <laughs> I'm here. How's the SARS? Quarantine area going. I'm feeling a lot better, thank you. Oh, that's good. Yes. <laughs> what's going anyway, on? Anyway, let's come round and no I'll show you what's been going on. As you can see, they've taken off. Bridget's going to dig the first of Gary's trenches inside the house where the concrete was, looking for a post hole and a wall trench. Gary's also placing trenches here and here, looking for another post hole and more walls of the aisled hall. But it's already five o'clock and there's only an hour's digging to go, so Matt Kerry and Bridget are under serious pressure. the end of a really frustrating first day. In here we thought these tiles would take us about an hour to get up and it's taken us all day but at last Kerry you're down on the archaeology aren't you? We are, we've just started and hopefully it's going to get better. So everything to play for in here. Over here though where we thought we might have half of a great Saxon hall, what have we got? We certainly haven't got half of a Saxon hall Tony, what we do have is a rather nice Iron Age ditch running through but certainly no Saxon hall. We don't know whether the Saxon 
layers were ever here or whether they've just been trashed by later activity. So we're never going to be able to prove whether your theory was right? Certainly, Tony, you're right. We will never know. But what we've got to do is rethink our strategy and look for other targets outside. Beginning of day two, and already we seem to have evidence of King Canute's Isle Hall inside this house. We thought it might extend out here, but we've drawn a blank in that trench. So we're casting our net a bit further and looking for other Saxon buildings in the rest of the garden. The question is, though, what are our targets? John, normally we get your geophys printouts early on day one, but it's taken forever this time. What's the problem? Well, we've had to come in with radar, and we've had to collect a huge amount of data. But we've got the results now from a big block we've done. Uh, and look, I mean, this is the only clear anomaly we've got. And if we look at all the plots, starting from the top and going into the ground, you can see this response starting to come into play and continuing down through the courtyard surface. And it's going down. It's the only feature we've got that appears to be going into the bedrock. Joe, what do you think that might be? Well, if it's actually going down into the bedrock and look at its placement with the house, I'm wondering if it could be a well of some sort. It might be a medieval well relating to the stone building as, as it exists today, or it could possibly be a, a, from the Anglo-Saxon period. Let's not say it is a well yet. Let's go and have a look at it. Yeah. It might be just a sunken feature, yeah. but we won't know until we've actually dig down and find out. Just just think yeah. what we might actually find at the bottom of well, that's it. True. That's the important <laughs> yeah. thing. So but we just got the one target? No. Look, what we've also done is we've done some magnetics and in the area towards the fish pond. And look at the results here. Ignore this area. That's where Jane's already excavated. But we've got these two responses here. That looks as though it could be metalworking residue, slag and so on. And then these really strong responses here that could actually be metal working in situ. We can go for all those targets yeah. in there. And yeah. also look for other targets in this area to find other buildings as well as the day goes yeah, on. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep doing that. Yes. <laughs> uh, will it take you as long as this lot? <laughs> I won't ask. We won't have <laughs> so, lots of targets. The first of which is Trench 5, which typically is under the spoil from Trench 1, where Phil is going to be looking for the well. You want to give about 10, ten oh, centimetres. <laughs> Right, well, I'm on 20. You pull that up and you're there. The wet conditions of a well can preserve organic material that otherwise decays. Like that. Yeah. Got it? Good. Better get out of the way, Phil. The big yellow trowel is now off to the fish ponds, where Geophys suggests we might find metal artefacts. We're opening two new trenches. Trench six, a big one looking for something like a furnace where metal might have been worked. And trench seven, looking for metal artifacts. And almost instantly, there's a find. <laughs> Not Saxon, is it? <laughs> Not at all. I mean, I wouldn't bother. Um... Geophys got it right. They can detect metal they just can't date uh, it. It's about an inch off, we're still in the crust there. And it's looking just as bleak in trench six. I suppose it's going to be Saxon nails. So far, it's 20th century two, Saxons nil. But they're going to keep on digging because geophys are convinced there's something else under here. <laughs> but the truth is, we're in trouble. And our only positive leads are in the house, which is at last ringing to the sound of trowels on dirt. We've got archaeologists working at this end of the hall and at this end of the hall, but through here we've got the trench where we've got the big clue which leads us to think that we might actually have hit Canute's Isle Hall. Do you mind if I get in your trench, Bridge? No, that's no problem, just go lightly. OK. Well, you can really see this wall trench now, can't you? You can. You can. I mean, from up here, it's so distinct. And what's really nice is you can actually see an end to it. it what's that? What, just sort of here? Right there. Right where that post hole is. And it just so happens the post hole has cut off the end of it. But it looks, in, I mean, a very high probability that that is 
the trench associated with the Saxon Hall that was here. That is fantastic news if we've got the end of the Saxon Hall. And what about these two post holes? Are they Saxon? No, they're much later. They're medieval. They're cutting through the Saxon archaeology. They've had to put up scaffolding for this 13th century building during the construction and that these are the post holes that have been, have been made. So what's happened to my fantastic post hole? The one that was supposed to be telling us that we've got Canute's Isle Hall? Well, it seems to be gone at the moment. <laughs> We're not sure what's going on, but if you come forward into the, um, the ditch area, yeah. and there's the black material. Here. Yeah, that's yeah. it. And then it goes shooting off towards that other post hole. Yeah. And it looks as though there's just a big square feature in the middle of the Saxon Hall. So we've got the end of the Saxon building, but the third post hole has turned into a mystery. The more we dig, the more confusing it seems to get, at least inside the house. Oh, Dan, what you got there? Oh, Gary, three shirts of Stamford wear. It was a good call to keep Trench 6 going because just 10 centimetres under the nails, Brilliant. Dan has found Saxon pottery. Just what we've been hoping Here's for. Here's the first Saxons I've found since I got here. Oh, well done. Yeah, that's great. The pot would have looked like this and been for domestic use. Even better, it looks as if the pottery has come from a Saxon feature. Um, so what's it looking like in the trench? Well, it's barren at that end, but there seems to be a large feature in this end. Um... I can't say what it is yet till I dig it, but it's definitely of Saxon date. When Canute was in residence at the hall on this site, it would undoubtedly have been the stage for royal entertainment, such as feasting, and to accompany the banquets, music. <laughs> It's a very haunting melody. It's a bit like a snake charmer, it strikes me. Uh, it was, rather. Uh, it's actually deer bone uh, reed pipe. Mm. This is a late Saxon instrument. I mean, is this the sort of sound, the sort of music that Canute would have heard when he was dining in the hall Absolutely. Here? In this kind of environment, uh, Canute's music would have been extremely important to him. And these are some of the instruments that uh, would probably have been involved in that, from the stringed instruments through to things like bone pipes and things. Uh, here I've got a, a manuscript of, um, of, of a song of the period, well, and you can see... Uh, well, the, where's the, the music? Where's... <laughs> well, the music is a fly specks above the lines of the, uh, the song. Do you see well, that? Well, how the hell can you know what this well, sounds like? We do have examples um, from other places where the same tune was written down, and we can tell it's the same tune um, much more clearly, maybe in alphabetical notation. Can you, can you actually play that? Yeah, I can have a go. That is genuine Saxon music. Genuine Saxon music. It's great stuff. So you're going to be making an instrument like that, are you? Uh, not exactly. I thought we'd go for, for this one. Um, this is larger than life size. It's about twice size, but it's uh, a find from uh, exactly the right period. It's made of elder wood. We've oh, sure. got some really good elder on the sides. Even though Canute was a strong king, the Viking hold on the throne of England was short-lived. Within years of his death, there were Saxon kings again, and this brief Viking interlude has been largely forgotten. Canute himself died quite young, and his three sons died even younger. The youngest of them all is probably only about 24. And when there was nobody else left, clearly there was no option but to go back to the previous dynasty. What do you think might have happened if the Viking families had stayed being rulers of England? Well, presumably it would have made a great difference because what happens when Edward the Confessor becomes king is that he eventually dies without an heir. He has promised the throne to William of Normandy before his death. And what happens then, of course, is the Norman Conquest. And there is the, the orientation of England towards France in a political sense, which results eventually in the Angevin Empire and the Hundred Years' War. And presumably none of these things would have happened. Why not? Well, where's the Saxon pot? The Saxon, early middle. So? Well, the pottery's early medieval. It's 11th, mid 11th, mid 13th. There's conflict in the air down at Dan's Trench, where more of the mystery features now visible. 
That's what I was told. Dan's convinced that it's an SFB. That's a Saxon building with the sunken floor to you and me. And if he's right, it's a very exciting find. But pottery expert Paul is sceptical. Carenza's the referee. So I'll believe it when I say it. Well, what at the then? moment, it's an interesting-looking feature that may be a building that we need to know more about. Yeah, oh, yeah, certainly need to investigate it, dig it and see what's you going on. it's not a Sang Saxon? I'd be very surprised, because one thing we do get around here in quantity is early Middle Saxon pottery, so if we've got, usually when you go to an SFB, you get plenty of pottery in it. Get me some early Saxon pot and I'll believe you. How's that? What if I give you the, the floor plan of an SFB? Nah, I want some finds. I want some dating. As does Phil in Trench 5, where he's found the top of the Geophys blob that may be a well, but he's got no idea whether it's Saxon or medieval. Inside the house, though, our Saxon hall's beginning to take shape. By the front door, Kerry's found the wall trench he was looking for, and we now definitely have the side of the building. Jane, on the other side of this wall, found a wall trench coming along here. And just Better the still, it, at the other end of the passage, Matt has found the end of the building and the fourth post hole on the right alignment. The interesting thing about this is it actually lines up, not entirely, but pretty well, with post holes that um, Bridget's got going up north. The ones way. through there? Yeah. Oh. And Bridget has dug the square feature and discovered, after all, that it's the third post hole which she thought she'd lost. But as the features come into focus, so does the next problem which is that the posts are very close to one of the wall trenches. Well, really, I mean, I think what we've got is either one of two options. We've either got, you know, one single phase of building, you know, we've got these huge post holes up, the, up in this line, and then we've got this slot over the side. But, you know, the problem with that is we've just got this tiny corridor of a space. I mean, you know, it's like this... Dark, tiny, doesn't, not very nice. Mm. The other option, of course, is we've got two phases of building, um, one of which is this beam slot and the other one associated with these post holes. So our various features that don't make sense in one building may actually belong to different buildings. And this seems to be confirmed by the plans of other Saxon sites. They all do look a bit kind of blurry, don't they? But what you've got to remember, Tony, is that the Anglo-Saxon trait was to build on top of where they built before. So these are wall lines, one on top of the other? Yeah, and in fact it would be quite unusual, actually, to have um, a, a complex of this type where you've only got one phase of building. Much more common to see two or three buildings built on the same, on the same site. To confirm whether the features belong to different buildings, we need to date them either by discovering that one cuts through another and is therefore later, or from finds. 279, oh! Oh, look at that! Right, and, and this is what Carenza and Paul are doing. They're looking at all of the finds, Jane's and ours, to see which of the post holes and wall trenches might belong together. Right, so that is when perhaps the Saxon building was demolished and... And it ties the... in with the dating we're getting from the yep. post pipes of the big post holes as well. Phil's now helping to make the replica of a Saxon pipe using a branch of elder and some fairly un-Saxon tools. Take the bark off, ideally, and take the... That's, that's quite sharp, you know. What? Knife? That knife? I'm going to put it now in a blunt knife, is it? Push. There it goes. It's going in. Push, push, push. It's gone through the node. It's gone through the node. I mean, quite incredible, cos we're... Just pushing. So just it's pushing. only this last little bit to do. You should get your knife and just trim down. Start whittling as though you're pointing a stick. Oh, right. You know what I mean? Putting a, a point on the end of it. And then we lose about that inch, and that should give us the... I mean, presumably it doesn't us, matter how long it is. Exactly. Hey! Yay! Hey. Hey. Eureka, it came out under pressure. <laughs> <laughs> did you see that? <laughs> Oh, wow, there's daylight right in there. What's happening here? In Dan's trench, know, we thought we might have an SFB, a Saxon building. It's not playing by the rules. It's, it, it's still a roughly rectangular feature with a, with, a, with a dark fill sitting in the natural, which, yeah, it's yellow on one side and white on the other, but apparently that's what it does. Yeah. It's still vertically sided and it's still flat bottomed, which, in an ideal world, would be a sunken floored building. Yep. However, it's now about three or four times too big, big to be a yes. sunken floor building. Yeah. It's not the right shape for a ditch. It's not the right shape for nope. a pit. It's not the right shape for a quarry. It's not the right shape for a pond. 
What the hell what is, is it? it? <laughs> I don't know. It's a good question, and Dan's still got plenty of digging to do. End of day two, and at last we're coming to grips with the archaeology inside the house. Outside, though, things are a bit more problematic. This morning, Geophys gave us a number of targets, but they've all proved pretty fruitless. So, we were hoping by now we'd have some more targets, but unfortunately, Geophys hasn't finished yet. Beginning of day three, and it looks like we may have got evidence of King Canute's Isle Hall, but the rest of the Saxon settlement is proving incredibly elusive, not least because we seem to have been waiting forever for Geophys throughout oh. the last two days. <laughs> Look, if you're doing radar, you've got to do it properly. You can't do it quickly. And look, you were talking rubbish last night. Every trench that we've put in on a geophysics anomaly has turned up it something. Has. It's explained what we've got. The unfortunate thing, it's not Saxon. But I can't be responsible for that. I didn't say you hadn't found anything. I said you were incredibly slow. I said he hadn't found Look, anything. Look, Phil, were we not spot on in that trench you're digging? I was gobsmacked last night. You walked by there and you said we found absolutely nothing. Yeah. Where John had indicated on the geophysics of that uh, there was a very strong anomaly, we've got a most beautiful pit feature, possibly a well. I mean, unfortunately, we've done the work now and we haven't actually got anything more for you. I mean, that is the downside. I'm not letting you off with last night, but the downside is we haven't got any targets. Yeah, you haven't got anything. Uh, no. I, I apologise, it wasn't slow, it's just that you haven't got anything for us. If it's not completely. there, we, we yeah, can't yeah. find it. All right. All right, gentlemen and lady. Uh, so, Geophys haven't got anything for us. Yeah. What we've got to talk about is what we're going to do today. Well, I still think we need to look for other buildings in this complex. If I geophys agree. If they're not visible to geophysics, that doesn't mean they aren't here. No. We look at other plans, other sites of similar dates. You see you've got a hall, but you've got masses of other buildings around. This is Westcott, not far from here. You've got Golfo, again, a hall, uh, lots of other buildings around. My proposal is that we're going to move those vans, yeah. we're going to move those people, and we're going to put in a trench over there as big as we possibly can. <laughs> it's a brave archaeologist who interferes with the digger's tea. Right, if we can get the tea out over there, people will still be able to get to it without falling in the trench. So we've given the job to Carenza. Her search for other manorial buildings is taking a real gamble. It's in the only bit of the garden that Geophys hadn't surveyed, but the pressure's on, and so we've got to go in blind. Coming through this way, is, is this our post hole? No, it must be. Inside the house, the archaeologists looking for Canute's Isled Hall are trying to work out which of the Saxon wall trenches and post holes belong together in one building. The original line of the wall coming up here, which Jane found, it returns across there. Do you think that could be the end of that building? Well, it could be the end of a building. A building. But that means that this trench, this wall trench is coming along and it's is it cutting or is it being cut by this post hole? That's actually quite <coughs> crucial, isn't it? It is. That is a very crucial point. Um... Does that... Because that could mean that we've got... For the first time, we've got a relationship between the wall trenches and the post and the holes. Post. Yes. And if one is cutting the other, then we may have more than one phase of building visible, actually, within the house. And that's the first time that's, we've got it, that it is. relationship, yes. Yes. isn't it? If the wall trench is cutting into the post hole, it means it's later and not part of the same building. If Matt can untangle this in the few remaining hours, it may be our breakthrough in determining the size and plan of Canute's Hall. Back at the pipeworks, it's time for music historian Graham Lawson to fit the cow horn bell. This will amplify the sound made by a reed at the other end. The mystery of Dan's Trench, which once seemed to promise a Saxon building, has now been resolved. There was no building. He's found a boundary ditch enclosing a Saxon field and containing one of the best, but most irrelevant, finds of the three days, a prehistoric arrowhead. 
But the important thing is, in Canute's time, yeah. this field probably looked exactly as it does now, with the pigs and the geese and the chickens and the pond. Yeah. But not this hole. Good. Elsewhere, we've got a remarkable find, which is part of our Saxon story. Um, I cleaned up that bit of pot you got out of that feature last night. Yeah. And it's a Stanford Ware oil lamp. Wow. Uh, sort of late Saxon, 10th, 11th century. You can't date them too closely. Mm. But it's a really nice thing to find. This lamp would have had wicks floating in fat and might have hung on a chain from a beam to light the hall and perhaps even Canute's banquets. The 12th century Ramsey Chronicle, which placed Canute here, has got a nice story about one of his visits to the manor. According to the account, one of his retinue, a bishop, was billeted with a Dane in a neighbouring manor and they got drunk. They ended up making a wager which was that if the bishop could provide 50 marks of gold, which is a very large sum of money, before dawn the following morning, he would be given the estate. And the bishop then came back to Canute here and found him apparently playing chess. Canute was rather surprised to see him, but nevertheless he looked through the royal coffers and loaned to the bishop as much gold as he had. Um, the bishop goes back to Elton, um, he gives the Dane the money, the Dane doesn't want to take it because he says he was drunk when he made the deal. Um, and they then come back to Canute here, and Canute gives judgment in favour of the bishop, and so he acquires the estate. So from that story, we can get a picture of Canute here at Nassington with a big retinue because he's got all his gold with him, enjoying himself, playing games, yes. but also dispensing justice uh, yes. and making legal decisions. Is yes. that the sort of thing that kings would have done travelling around the country? Oh, I think all the time. Indeed, part of the reason for travelling actually was to dispense justice. Back in her trench, Carenza thinks she could be onto one of the other buildings from the Saxon Manorial complex. But as with all our trenches, it's extremely difficult to see the archaeology cut into the bedrock. But I think it might be redeposited natural. It's been brought in to help level up the, the yard surface. Yeah, I think we're starting to get some of this clay. Right, so there is something it. else underneath there. Yeah. So there may be archaeology here, but how old? And can we find it in the time remaining? Joe's story, our Saxon building expert, has been struggling for three days to try to work out the shape of Canute's Hall. At the moment, her best guess is that it was an aisled hall with two rows of posts. Though we've only got one, the theory is that there would have been a second row which is still buried under the wall of Jane's house. The wall trenches would have belonged to a separate building. But pottery expert Paul Blinkhorn doesn't like this at all. About 20 years ago, they excavated a very similar structure to this at Rawns, just down the road. I worked on the post-excavation of it, and we ended up with this structure that is similar to what we've got here. We've got four great big post holes in a line, and then behind it, we've got a sleeper beam. So, whereas Joe's saying that uh, we might have one building on our site, which is these two sets of posts, and another building, which is these two sets of trenches, you're saying that this bit could be one building. Yeah. It's a bit peculiar to have your roof resting on big timber posts on one side and on a wall the other side. You're effectively mixing two types of building techniques within one structure, and that would be a very peculiar way of doing it. It would be unique to this area. We're not seeing it nationally. You're creating a theory to justify what you think you've found. Well, the evidence at Fernals, we agonise it over it for a long time, and this is what it pointed towards. Now, I can actually think of a reason why you'd have this. There's actually a break in the beam slot, and there's a central post, and what we think we've got is an entranceway. This is facing the church over there. So I'm wondering if this sort of construction is... This is the posh side of the building. It's the side of the building, if you're a member of the public, you come into the hall, you're approaching this, and you see this beautifully carved frontage. Round the back, you've just got the yard area with the kitchens and stuff, so you don't need to go to all that trouble um, producing a really nice posh carved um, wall. You just stick in some posts, bang some wattle panels in between, and whitewash the whole lot. It's a quick, it's a cheaper way of doing it. You'd expect then there to be large, substantial post holes. Well, no, that doesn't have this to be. This is an argument that's been going be. on for two and a half days and will continue until we finish. Let's hope that sometime in the next four or five hours <laughs> we'll find something sufficiently diagnostic to set this argument to rest. <laughs> OK. Even though the archaeologists haven't yet resolved the shape of Canute's Hall, 
Karenda and Paul reckon that the finds can tell us a good deal about it. We're basically getting two distinct ceramic horizons. I think that's what, what this is giving us, is the construction date for the timber hull and the demolition date for the timber hull. So it looks like it was built round about 1,000 and it was knocked down round about 1,200. Excellent. That's fascinating. So yeah. it stood for perhaps 200 years and this place is as almost certainly the building that Canute would have come yes. to. Yeah. Absolutely. Another quite interesting thing I've noticed as well is um, there doesn't seem to be very much 12th century pottery. So okay. I'm beginning to think that this building might actually have been abandoned not long after the Norman Conquest, around about 1100. Okay. So yeah. it's telling us a picture, I think. And certainly it was, it was at its zenith for the first 50 years, perhaps of the 11th century, either side of Canute's reign. And then, it really slots yeah. into that period. And what's the really crucial piece of evidence, Paul, for what was actually going on inside This it? is the absolute clincher. Uh, I'm afraid it doesn't look much, but it's this. Um, this is a piece of Pingsdorf ware. It's made in the Rhineland uh, in the 11th century. Mm. Now, you find quite a lot of this in the coastal ports in England, but you hardly ever find it inland. So anyone who was living here, if they were living here and they were drinking wine, they must have had a fair bit of clout. It's high status. Yeah. And it doesn't look much, but it's only the seventh shirt of this in the county of Northampton, and it's the first one from the, from the countryside. So that is, that's my find of the week. It yeah. doesn't look much, but that's my find of the week. Put your fingers on and see what you get. Nothing at all. A bit less pressure. Oh. Less. <laughs> you've got something. I don't know what you've got. <laughs> I can't play an instrument like this. I can't play an instrument. This is hopeless. What Phil's had his eyes on all along is this. It's the King Canute Blues, man. It yeah. is. It's well, I woke up this morning. Phil seems much happier with the Saxon lyre. Back in the 21st century, we're still looking for other buildings from the Saxon estate. Earlier on today, we put a trench in over here. It was our last throw of the dice to see if we could come up with any evidence of buildings on the Saxon estate. We didn't have any geophys targets. Carenza put it in, really on a combination of hunch and whim. So obviously it's bound to be jam-packed full of archaeology, isn't it, Carenza? Well, actually, it has worked. The reason we put it here was that having looked at other plans, we were sure there must be other buildings around and wanted to get away from this building. And thank goodness we did actually turn up what I think is the first evidence we've ever had on this site for any buildings of Saxon date other than the main hall. All right, that's a very big claim and one very small hole. What is it? <laughs> well, this is it. This is just half of it. Effectively, there's two or three post holes here. There's a large post hole of which we've excavated just half of it here. And in fact, there's another small post hole there and another one right by the red peg up there. And at the very top, we found pieces of this. This is pottery dating to 1150 or just afterwards. And that shows that the building that was held up by the posts that occupied these holes had collapsed or been demolished by that date. Have you any idea what this building might have been for? Well, we can't get much idea of the size from one post hole, though it's a fairly big post hole, so possibly quite big. And in terms of what it was used for, I think we've got two possibilities. One is it was used for metalworking. We had a small piece of slag from the post hole. The other, though, has actually come from finds that Jane had. These are weaving picks that are used for just tightening down the wefts on the loom. So metalworking or weaving. We're a bit short of evidence, but this kind of activity would have taken place in a building that looked like this. After three days and eight trenches, it's all come down to this small trench containing a post hole and a beam slot. Do you remember that we, when we were talking about this earlier, that we said that we had uh, one wall trench in, in Matt's area here, running along to Bridget's area, that was shallower and narrower than the one that Kerry had been digging. Well, that's this one that's here. That's this one here, yeah. yeah. What Matt has established is that there's another wall trench running along uh, this way, so across the width of that building. But what he's established is that this wall trench uh, is uh, cuts our, one of our big post holes. It cuts it? 
So the post hole is older than the actual trench? Yeah, absolutely. So that solved one of our key uh, questions that, that we needed to know, because that gives us two phases for the timber hall. Matt, I can't really see where this trench cuts the post hole. Can you show me? Yes, yeah, it's, it's not very clear, but if you look in the section here, um, you can see an arc of, of clay coming up there, which um, mirrors the base of this trench, so it means that it's been coming across here, and you can see the profile of it in this section there. Fantastic. So we've got two buildings. We've got an older one made of these big columns of wood and then a later one of a completely different construction. Yeah, represented by these walls uh, that Matt's identified here. So we've finally untangled the mystery of the buildings which were here before Jane's house. There were two halls, neither of which was a true aisled hall. One using the wall trenches, probably built in around 1200, and an earlier timber hall using the post holes. It was in this earlier building that Canute lived. We now know that it occupied roughly the same space as the present building. Along there, there would have been a big line of wooden pillars which reached right up to a vast timber roof which was at least as high as the present one. It would have been an imposing residence with huge tapestries hanging between the big wooden columns and a hearth at one end. It was here that King Canute received his guests, played chess and feasted heartily. No doubt to the accompaniment of some of the finest musicians in Northamptonshire. Phil, I don't suppose you know anything a bit more modern, do you? Well, I don't know if we do, actually. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs>